All right, uh, move on already. Get over it. Yeah, get, get over it. What do you get over when you get over democracy? Huh? We begin with thanks. Okay? I want to thank, and I want you to thank, Dave Mazza, okay, of the, the Portland Alliance, who has brought us together tonight for the Armed Madhouse Class War Boot Camp, and uh, Beth Hahn of the Oregon Voter Rights Coalition. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, and a special, special up for your weapon of mass instruction in Portland, KBOO Radio. And Joe and Abe, thanks a lot. Really. And special thanks also to the Alliance for Democracy, because we, we need them now that we have, in Washington, an alliance against democracy. So the Alliance for Democracy is really refreshing in Portland. Uh, a special friend of mine on the front lines of the fight against Enronization of the rest of the nation. Nancy Newell, a big up. We owe her thanks. And here, and especially, I have a special personal request of you. I want everyone to applaud Kat Lestrange, my national tour director, who put this whole thing together on an international basis. Thank you very much, Kat, of Eugene, Oregon. Okay. Mm. I want you, and by the way, this is the international launch of the Arm Madhouse Tour. <laughs> um, it's, we did it today, because tomorrow's the official launch of Ann Coulter's book. <laughs> It, you know, tomorrow's June 6th, so it, uh, oh, 6, 666, so she's releasing a book in honor of her father's birthday. And I want you to look at CNN's balls here. Five minutes after 1 a.m. in the morning, November 3rd. You might want to turn this down, I got some feedback here. Now, it's, it says here that among men, this is the exit polls. People are walking out there asking, who did you vote for? And among men, Kerry won 51% to 49%. However, among women, Kerry won 53% to 47%. Okay, class, what's the third sex that put Bush over the top? <laughs> now, I'm just a reporter, but I was assigned to cover the election for a pirate station, BBC Television out of London. And so we've been investigating some odd doings in the United States, a team that I was heading. So I looked at that and I reported, I had to report the results. So I told the planet, I announced that in Ohio, John Kerry had won. He won the votes, but then I explained that it doesn't get inaugurated, see. <laughs> what happened? What happened? So I wrote, and then I wrote some stories called Kerry won. And oh, you read those New York Times, right? <laughs> Actually, the New York Times did interview me. They did conduct an investigation of the 2004 election. They sent me an email and called me up. They said, we, want, we are investigating the 2004 election, and we have a couple questions for you. I had file cabinets. I said, okay, question one, are you a sore loser? <laughs> I, I don't care which rich white guy wins, and I'm just a reporter, okay, whatever. <laughs> question two, um, are you a conspiracy nut? 
And question three, well, there was no question three. That was the entire New York Times interview. I actually have that in writing. That was it. And so they ran, but they did publish on page one the results of their investigation titled, I can't make this up, Internet Theories of Bush Loss Spread by Blogs Easily Debunked. <laughs> that was it for the paper of record. Now let's get back to the balls here. Kerry wins among women by 53%. Among men, 51-49. What is that third group called? The answer is the disappeared, <laughs> the uncounted. OK, now, let me tell you a nasty secret about American democracy that Mrs. Gordon didn't tell you about in the third grade. Because in the third grade, you raised your hand for class president, and she counted all the hands. But in America, in 2004, November 2nd, in Ohio, George Bush was announced the winner by 118,000 votes, not counting 239,127 votes, almost twice as many votes as the so-called victory margin were never counted. And you know, Here's the nastier secret. It ain't just Ohio. And in 2000, it wasn't just Florida. That's what they want you to think. Not counting the votes as American as apple pie. And there were 3,600,380 votes cast and never counted in the United States of America, not the Ukraine, not Uganda. 3.6 million votes. Now wait, you know, this is not from a blog. It didn't come from a black helicopter. I got this from deep in the files of the Election Administration, in the Election Information Administration of the United States government for which we stand. Now, there are two piles of votes that are uncounted. Two big flavors. Spoiled votes, rejected votes. Spoiled votes. 1,389,231 of these spoiled. They didn't count. Now, how do votes spoil? I'm, I mean, leave them out of the fridge? I, uh, no. Hanging chads. They hung around from 2000. They multiplied. They didn't get it. You know, we had a lot of discussion. It's like, that went away. Hanging chads, punch cards that don't punch, touch screens that didn't think you touched them right. They weren't in the mood. They did not respond to your touch. In other words, there's glitches. Glitches. You talk to the... Bush vote count people, no count people. Glitch, glitch, glitch. That's three million, 1.3 million glitches. Who's glitches? Who gets glitched in America? In another life I'd like to forget about, I taught statistics at the university level. We did some work with some of my colleagues and we came up with these two bars. Now, there's a little short bar. The little short bar is the number of glitched votes cast by white voters, voters in white majority districts. The big, long, thick bar is the black bar. And that is the number of the percentage of votes cast by African Americans, which are glitched, not counted. OK? One in seven votes, nearly, in the United States of America. OK? Let's put it this way. Let me give you a statistic that Mrs. Gordon didn't tell you about. In the United States of America, 
the chance your vote will be lost or rejected for a technical reason is 900 percent greater if you're an African-American voter than if you're white. 500 percent higher if you're a Hispanic voter than if you're white. And if you're Native American, about 2,000 percent higher than if you're white. Yeah. Let's do a little, if you know the demographics of the United States of America, let's do a little high school algebra and you will quickly figure out in that stinking, rotting pile of spoiling votes, 88% are cast by voters of color, almost 9 out of 10. Whose votes don't count, whose votes spoil? It has a very dark hue. And you read about that in the New York Times, <laughs> in the Oregonian. Yeah. Disappeared with the votes. New Mexico, so Ohio, 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 Ohio. In fact, it's terrific now we've got Bobby Kennedy in Rolling Stone. Finally, you get a, a rich white guy to say, yeah, that's right, they stole it, um, which is very important. We got to get that word out. But if you thought it was Ohio, they've got gotcha. Because you got to know it's coming. So I flew to New Mexico, where George Bush, I was told, and we were told, won by 5,988 votes. Just this little thin amount. OK not counting the 34,000 ballots sitting in the garbage. 34,000 ballots cast and sitting in the garbage. Spoiled, rejected, and waiting to be counted. And were never counted. Now, there seem to be some problems with the machines. Not everywhere. I don't know, maybe there worsened the problem. But if you go to Taos Precinct 13, better known as the Taos Native Pueblo, you find some interesting things. In several of the Pueblos and reservations throughout the West, natives apparently drove all the way to the polls and didn't choose a president. They walked in, they walked out. <laughs> there are precincts one in 10 Natives voted for President of the United States. So I went to Precinct 13 and I talked to a guy that's called the War Chief. I said, okay, Chief, you engines can't make up your mind, a bunch of indecisive engines, you don't know who you want for president? He said, listen, white boy. <laughs> Come here, pale face, let me talk to you. We know who to pick for president. I'll give you 50 bucks if you find a Republican in this Pueblo. We know who to vote for president. We picked the president, but we didn't pick the voting machines. We didn't pick the voting machines. We trusted them, the county officials. We don't give Indians blankets filled with smallpox anymore. We just give them junk voting machines, right? Now, the Republicans know this, yeah? There's a letter from a guy named Kenneth Blackwell of Ohio. Blackwell, I, I think, it actually changed his name from White Sick, but. Um, and he wrote to another, to the Republican head of the Senate, that if they don't fix the punch card machines, that there was going to be a Florida-like calamity. He was boasting because he was also not only Secretary of State in charge of the vote, he was co-chair of the Bush re-election campaign. And you know that you really shouldn't wear two hats unless you have two heads, and I'm still checking into that with Mr. Black. <laughs> and by the way, he was sued by the ACLU before the election to change the machines. He said, no problem. 
see you in court. And they set the court date for three weeks after the election. But he's, it's okay, he's running for governor now. So, and he'll be counting the votes in his own race. <laughs> Let's go to the second pile now of unvotes. These are called provisional ballots rejected. Now, do you remember in the third grade in your civics class, the provisional ballots? You know, Americans go to the polls and they vote. You know, okay, everyone raised their hand for class president. Oh, Timmy, your vote's provisional. <laughs> Where did provisional voting come from? What, is, what happened? Well, in 2002, after the national embarrassment of Florida, okay, I know there are those of you who think it was an electoral coup d'etat. Um, in fact, here's what happened. If you've read my prior books, whatever. A few months before the election, Catherine Harris and Jeb Bush ordered the removal of illegal voters. That's correct. If they're felons, they got to go. And they targeted 94,000 voters who were felons, including, um, yeah, they targeted voters. And um, turns out it was a mistake. 97% were guilty only of voting while black. George Bush won the presidential election officially by 537 votes, not counting 94,000 people scrubbed. The Congressional Black Caucus said, we gotta do something about this. We gotta have something where someone walks to the poll and they're scrubbed off incorrectly that they can still vote. We would demand a provisional ballot and Karl Rove said, great idea. <laughs> now, some of us thought that was a kind of signal of danger. <laughs> so they got their provisional ballots. George Bush signed it into law in the Help America Vote Act of 2002. Now, when George Bush tells us he's going to help us vote, <laughs> now he helped. He helped. Who got provisional ballots? Those who were challenged or found their registrations purged or challenged. How many? Three million. Three million voters were shoved into the back of the bus provisional ballot. Three million. And the number in the garbage can? 1,090,729 votes were taken and thrown away. Like that? Who? Okay. See, because the HAVA law, when George Bush signed the law to help us vote, he accepted the Black caucus demand that voters get the right to a provisional ballot if they're challenged, if there's any question about their right to vote. But they didn't include any provision to have the votes counted. How did they get three million? The Congressional Black Caucus thought 100,000 nationwide, three million. A mass challenge of voters across the country not seen since the days of Jim Crow. How did that happen? And why didn't we see it coming? Actually, you would have seen it coming if you watched my program, BBC Television, because a week before the election, we put this on the air. I don't, I don't know how Cheney can do that from so far away. Um, <laughs> Um, well, see, this is the way I get you to buy the book because it's too small to read. But you pass, it. I pass it around. Um, here's what I got. This is a list of voters and their addresses. 
pretty benign stuff, but it came through an odd source. There were emails being sent between the chief operations officer at the Republican National Committee and the, and the state party chairman. Now, what were they doing with these lists of voters? And how did I get it? Well, see, they were passing them out. This was highly confidential. And they were emailing each other, and somehow it ended up in my computer. <laughs> Such things happen. It did. <laughs> and so um, I won't tell you how. Um, so I went to BBC television and said, well, Greg, you better go check this out. So I flew to Washington, D.C. from London and confronted the chairs of the Republican National Committee with the information. Then they slammed the door. We went to Tallahassee, looked to a state chairman. I said, what is this? And a flackhead came out and said, her name is, by the way, Mindy Tucker Fletcher. And she said, oh, uh, a list of donors. So I flipped through the charts and said, I mean, this, all these guys from the homeless shelter? <laughs> Big Bush Cheney donors? They're, they're grateful that they get to live outdoors? OK, fine. Maybe there's something else. Oh, well, no, 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 not exactly. No, not exactly at all. This was a list of voters to be challenged. Page after page, we got, I don't know, probably 60,000 names that we just sucked right out of the Republican Party computers. And we went through them. Who are these? Who were the people on the list? Name after name. We spent, I can't tell you how much time we spent doing this. Every single name, or I should say 98%, came out of African-American majority precincts, OK? Except for 2%, which were Jewish majority precincts and retirement homes in Florida, <laughs> which suggested a democratic demographic, right? This was a challenge list. So why were they so squirrely about it? These were suspect voters, subject to challenge. Why were they squirrely about it? Why not just say so? These people shouldn't vote. They're suspect. OK, the answer is that if it's, if it's black, 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 black. See, federal law makes it a crime to target for challenge voters on the basis of race, where race is a factor. It's a crime. It's jail time. Now, as I asked Mindy Tucker Fletcher about this, now, of course, the cops, the civil rights voting cops, at that time, the top cop was a guy named John Ashcroft. <laughs> now, I asked Mindy if she thought that Ashcroft would be grabbing the, the state party chairman and, and reading them their rights. I asked Mindy, who was the Republican Party spokesman, because up till the week before, she was the press spokesman for John Ashcroft. So who were suspect? Maybe they shouldn't vote. Nasty, illegal, but maybe they shouldn't vote. And the way the Republican Party knew that their addresses were suspect, they sent them in a multi-million dollar operations first class letters to these addresses if they came back. And it said, do not forward. If they came back, they said the address is suspect, stop the vote or give them a provisional ballot. So who is suspect? Look on this list. We called up several. Randy Prousa was one. If you look on this page, every single name, Naval Air Station, these are all black soldiers sent overseas. 
thousands. So the letters came back because they said do not forward to Germany and Baghdad. And they lost their vote. It was like the felon story. It, but you read that in the New York Times. <laughs> Internet theories. We put it on BBC TV. Uh, and people stopped me in the street and said, so Bush has to um, step aside now, right? <laughs> no. Thousands of black soldiers. Um, and by the way, just, just so you know, it's not illegal for a soldier to vote from Fallujah in their home district, even if they're a black soldier, okay? So, you know, thousands lost. Mission accomplished, Mr. President. So why are they in Baghdad? Well, I, know that, I know some of you want me to talk about computer voting machines, but that's not an issue. Don't worry about that man behind the screen, Dorothy. We didn't find anything wrong there. That's in New Mexico. There's someone slipped uh, this out the back door of the cent company tabulating the votes from central tabulating machines. I, I thought it was kind of interesting. It was lists of, um, you know, the precinct returns, which you don't get to see because that's been privatized. But someone thought I should take a look. And fascinating, um, it, it has Kerry Edwards in precinct five, and they got 69 votes, Bush Cheney. 75 votes, et cetera. Then you go to, to Precinct 9B, where apparently you have the Bush totals, the Cobb totals, the Nader totals. But apparently, um, John Kerry and John Edwards weren't running in that precinct. Selected precincts where there was no Kerry to tabulate. But I'm sure the, the machines made the right choice for us. So why were those soldiers in Baghdad besides getting them out of the, out of the way of the polling places? I mean, I know that there are cranks and kooks and conspiracy nuts among you. <laughs> Kabu listeners in particular, who think we have that we went into Iraq for the oil, that in fact George Bush had some kind of plan for Iraq's oil fields even before the tanks rolled. And that's wrong, because he had two plans. <laughs> now I have them both, but I do have a problem because they say, like this one says, that the contents are confidential and should not be reproduced or distributed. The State Department will maintain the contents sealed. Oh, heck, I'll show you anyway. <laughs> First plan is interesting. I mean, it's actually, this is just one sheet from it. From the, and you can see all this stuff in our madhouse. The first plan came to me in a brown envelope. And it was very interesting, 101 pages long. It was an occupation plan. Okay. And it had some interesting things in that plan. Now you'd think it'd be maybe something about securing the borders, fighting insurgents. It was about tax cuts for the rich of Iraq, a flat tax. It was about, ex they had pages of extending and expanding the copyright laws. So no longer could the Bath Party threaten us with bootleg copies of Britney Spears, baby, one more time. <laughs> and so on. Where did this come from? Who came up with a plan? You know, it's like 111 pages. And, you know. There's a certain smell to this plan. I smelled Grover Norquist. Now, Grover, otherwise known unkindly as Gopher Nose Twist, 
He is the capo di capi of corporate lobbyists of Washington on the right. Okay. He works with the Christian Coalition, the NRA. Microsoft was a client, American Express. And here was, didn't look like an occupation plan, but it looked like a Christmas wish list for corporate America. So I took a chance and on a couple of tips and I went over to K Street and there was Grover and I showed him the 101 pages and he practically leaped over the desk to sign it, his baby. We sat under a big poster of his hero, Nixon now more than ever. <laughs> and there was something else. At page 73, privatization, asset sales, concession, leases, and management contracts for all state industries, especially the oil and supporting industries, especially the oil, privatization, selling off Iraq's oil fields. So there it was, looked like blood for oil. By the way, we gotta change that slogan. We can't keep saying no blood for oil, no blood for oil. Because most Americans think, you know, blood for oil is a bargain, okay? So. <laughs> we gotta try something else. And in fact, we didn't. We didn't sell off Iraq's oil fields. Now that's interesting. What happened? Who objected? The Iraqis? Uh, yeah. <laughs> that didn't count. The answer came to me in the second document. 323 pages long, which took two years for us to get. Let me tell you, because they, we you know, tried the formal Freedom of Information Act, which is neither under the Bush regime, neither free nor informative at this point. And so they didn't exist, didn't exist, didn't exist, and got some hints about who might know about it. And we finally got to Houston, and we found, and we spoke to some oil company executives about the plan. I started chatting, talking, the plan, the plan. We didn't know you had authority to discuss the plan. I said, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the. <laughs> but, but I don't know, my draft, I don't know what's, I don't know if we're talking about the same draft. What's the name of your draft? This is the dumbest, oldest trick. <laughs> And they gave me the names of places, and pretty soon, you know, it's like, so. I said, could you send me your copy? I don't <laughs> the masters of the universe are not as masterful as you think. Okay, I just want to tell you right now. And by the way, they did deny that they spoke with me, so I want to make it clear. It's fabricated. Greg Palace made up. They, when I first reported, not only first for BBC and then for Harper's Magazine, um, two oil company operatives, one really big name oil chief, um, threatened to sue Harper's, never spoke to me. And I said, okay, so then which part of this tape is not your voice? <laughs> I don't know what happened, but I ha just by accident, I have to be wired. <laughs> but where did it come from? <laughs> I smelled Baker. I don't mean the guy who makes the muffins. <laughs> Jim James Baker. And not just any James Baker, but the third. <laughs> James Baker the third. Now, if you don't know who James Baker the third is, okay, 
He is legal counsel to Exxon Corporation. He is senior legal counsel to Carlyle Group. He's consigli consigliere to the Bush family and the Republican Party. In fact, in, he spoke to a crowd of Russian oligarchs trying to get their business and said, if they didn't know who he was, I, he said, I'm the guy that fixed the election for George Bush in Florida. <laughs> he was joking. <laughs> and he also, though, has a job, come on, that, that we have to respect because when on the, regarding the September 11th attack, the families of the victims of the September 11th attack, you know, sued the government of Saudi Arabia for financing Al-Qaeda. And um, James Baker is the chief lawyer, represents Saudi Arabia against the victims of September 11th. And that's why he has an office. If you can't find his main office in Houston, you can go to his satellite office at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. He actually has an office in the White House. I'm not kidding you. First time in American history, a lobbyist for a foreign government and oil company is one of the White House. In fact, the um, White House press office, when I asked them about this, um, said that, in fact, he uses the uh, Oval Office desk sometimes when uh, and the president plays on the rug. <laughs> I made that up. I made that up. I'm, I'm, I, I'm sorry about that. I, I apologize. Anyway, the plan is called, it is the plan for sustainable Iraqi oil industry. A plan for Iraqi oil industry. Now, I know some of you think that maybe Iraqis should be planning their plan for the Iraqi oil industry, but you don't understand democracy. <laughs> and all throughout it, they keep talking about the, the, what Iraq must do with the IOCs, international oil companies, IOCs. There's no LOCs, there's no local oil companies in this plan, it's all IOCs what we call big oil. And they said exactly in detail, in 323 pages, what they want. It was drafted out of the James A. Baker III Institute in Houston with oil company chiefs. And through the State Department imposed on Iraq. And what did they want? I'll tell you what they didn't want. They didn't want Iraq's oil, at least not too much of it. Now, this is where it gets just weird and surprised me. What it says is, the most important explanation of this most important phrase in the whole thing is that this plan will enhance the Iraq government's relationship with OPEC. Enhance the relationship with OPEC. Now, what exactly did that mean? I went to Houston and talked to the guys, including the CEO of Shell. Enhance the relationship with OPEC. Now, I know that you can enhance your relationship with your wife or girlfriend with flowers, you enhance your relationship with your lord through prayer. How do you enhance your relationship with an oil cartel? <laughs> and the answer is, you limit your production to a quota set by Saudi Arabia. Now, here's what it is. OPEC is the Organization of Petroleum Exporting countries. It is a combine of producers who agree to divide the market and limit their production to squeeze up the price. In other words, it's an illegal conspiracy against trade. You do it here in the United States, you go to jail. If you do it in a bathrobe and a crown, you are called a royal. <laughs> and you get to ride around in the golf cart at the Crawford Ranch. 
with George. It has to be a golf cart because, you know, he's afraid of horses. Now, that I'm not taking back. The fear was the in, there was a meeting held in Dick Cheney's bunker in March of 2001, just weeks after they had taken office. By the way, just two weeks after they took office, there was a meeting in Walnut Creek, California, where the invasion was planned. Okay? The people in the meeting, once I discovered it, described it all. All right? But they needed a reason. They concerned. They went over the oil maps of Iraq with Cheney. Ken Lay was in the meeting, by the way, too. He was asked for his opinion. Okay? Saddam was out of control. He was jerking the oil markets. We had limited his production, first through a complete embargo, then to two million barrels a day under the Oil for Food program. We didn't say sell as much oil as you need for food. We said two million barrels a day. So it wasn't about food. It was capping the oil. See, let me give you economics lesson number one about oil. The less of it there is on the market, the higher the price. Now, that may seem very simple, but it's very hard to get across to Americans because we think of oil companies as hunting for oil. They are hunting for profits. And when they go out to hunt, it's to find the oil and shut off the spigot. Keep the price up. Now, technically, if they were to have anything to do with OPEC, that would then violate, that would be a crime in the United States. It would be, it'd be uh, by the way, internet, considered international piracy. So I take it it's not a crime for Exxon's lawyer and Saudi, the Saudi lawyer, Mr. Baker's Institute, to plan the limit of production for OPEC in Iraq. That's, I don't want anyone to think that's a crime. I don't want anyone to think that's why they make this confidential. I don't want anyone to think, because that's going to be a problem in this regime. <laughs> you have, let me give you a little history. I, it was very hard to understand. The, the purpose of this plan is to say Iraq must not, shall not, and never will produce more than three million barrels of oil a day when they can produce six. There are 74 fields, oil fields in Iraq. Only 15 have ever been put into production. There are 526 reservoirs, known reservoirs of oil in Iraq, and only 125 have ever been drilled. Now, why? That's why Iraq was created. In 1920, Winston Churchill invented Iraq as a oil buffer for a company called Anglo-Persian, now British Petroleum. He crafted it out of three oil fields, Kirkuk, Basra, Baghdad. The idea, which we're now paying for today, that if you have Sunni, Shiites, and Kurds together, locked together in one bottle, in one nation, that they will fight so much that they will never overthrow their colonial lords, the British Petroleum Corporation, to lock it in. And then they brought in, shades of Ahmed Chalabi, they, they brought in a guy named Faisal, never seen Baghdad, and said, you're king. And Faisal signed a deal, gave all the oil of Iraq under concession to a guy named Kaloust Gilbankian. And in 1925, Kaloust brought in British Petroleum, Standard Oil, which is now Exxon, the French companies, Anglo-Persian, sat them down on a floor in a hotel room in Brussels with a big giant map of the Mideast, and he took a big red mark you know, big red ink blotter and circled Iraq and Syria. And every oil company executive signed that. They purchased his concession, left him with 5%, so he's called Mr. 5% to this day, and agreed never to drill that oil. But that was a diplomatic problem. They had to pretend to drill the oil. Pretend to drill the oil. 
So there is actually a diplomatic note. When British government said to um, British Petroleum, you have to look like you're drilling the oil, they said, don't worry, we're drilling shallow wells where we are certain, and this is a quote, where we are certain not to discover oil. That's a quote. And so in 1960, in the early 1960s, Iraq grabbed the oil fields, expropriated them. You know what? We talk about wars. I'd like to talk to you about the war that never happened. The British government called John Kennedy and said, because they'd already, you know, our CIA previously, under Eisenhower, had overthrown the government of Iran after it seized the oil companies and the oil fields. He said, okay, it's Iraq's turn. They've grabbed the oil fields. And John Kennedy told the British Prime Minister, you've been robbing the people of Iraq for so long, that's not an expropriation, that's justice. Bang, no war. No war for oil. Okay. Give one to Kennedy, they did. Less oil, higher the price. So we, it wasn't blood for oil, it was blood for no oil to control that market, okay? Make it simple for you. Bill Clinton left office with oil at $20 a barrel, cheaper than peanut butter. Today, it's $73 a barrel, mission accomplished. And that's why they have to kill Hugo Chavez. <laughs> yeah. See, I got something else from the Department of Energy, which I just showed on BBC television. Department of Energy then called the BBC and said, where'd you get that? We forgot. <laughs> this says, Orinoco Extra Heavy Oil Resources. What this document is telling you is that Venezuela, that underneath Venezuela, and therefore underneath Hugo Chavez, the president there, who they're very jealous of because he was elected. <laughs> and, and they said Hugo Chavez has five times as much oil underneath his lands than Saudi Arabia. Five times as much. So I flew down to Caracas and I talked to President Chavez myself about it. We went over this. He said, yeah. And he says, then I'll give it to you cheaper than the Saudis. I'll cut the price by one third and make it even cheaper for every low income community in the United States. I'll sell it directly. Who knock immediately a buck a gallon off the price at the pump. Now you'd think our president would jump down there and wash Hugo's car with his tongue. I mean, we've had American industry, the OECD calculated the high oil prices have cost America over one million jobs, especially in the auto and, and airlines industries. Wait, auto and airlines, that's Democrats, unionized workers, mission accomplished. Okay, what's it about? Why not? See, when George goes around in the golf cart with Abdullah, it's not because he wants the Saudi's oil. Abdullah and his harem can only drink so much, right? They have to sell it to us in Japan and elsewhere. What we get out of it not, is not petroleum. Of course, maybe he was discussing democracy with Abdullah in the golf cart, but we think not. Not petroleum, but petrodollars. Remember the film network where a truth-telling journalist is confronted by a media mogul, big corporate executive, who says, Mr. Beale, the Arabs have taken billions of dollars from us. Now we must get it back. It goes out, it comes in the ebb and flow of finance. Last year, 
$253 billion flowed out to OPEC from the United States, a quarter of a trillion dollars and $311 billion came back. A third of a trillion came back. What was that about? See, when you pay $350 at the pump, Exxon takes a big slice. Okay? And in fact, since the war began, Exxon, the value of Exxon's reserves have grown by $666 billion. $666 billion. The devil's in the details. Now, <laughs> and so the money comes back to buy U.S. Treasury bills and Treasury bonds and our ports, whatever. So that George, and that's what funds George Bush's $2 trillion spending spree, which he claims to have done stone sober. $2 trillion. So 100% of the increase in our national debt of $2 trillion has come from borrowing abroad with the keystone, the petrodollars. Abdullah lends us his, our billions back. It's a hidden oil tax, see? Take it from you, goes out, comes back. Abdul lends us the trillion, his third of a trillion. We lend him back the 82nd Airborne. Fair deal? Chavez says no deal. He says, I'll give you cheaper oil. And in your low-income communities, even cheaper oil for heating. But I'm not giving you our money back. It's Venezuela's money is going to stay in Venezuela and Latin America. And to make the point, he withdrew $20 billion out of the U.S. Federal Reserve of Venezuela petrodollars and lent it to Argentina and Ecuador and other nations. <laughs> well, wait, that wasn't very smart because our president's response was to, to speak through his spiritual advisor, the <laughs> Reverend Pat Robertson, who said, Hugo Chavez thinks we're trying to assassinate him, and I think we ought to just do it. <laughs> you withdraw the money, and it's a date with a bullet. No, it's blood for no oil. It's blood for petrodollars. So, what are you going to do about it? I just told you what they're going to do in the next election. Well, I almost told you. You've got to read the book now, but it's, and, you know. By the way, I've only touched on two chapters out of five in the book, but I, I don't want people crawling out of here in <laughs> tears. What are you going to do about it? Next election, there's more votes in the spoilage bin. Voter IDs, we haven't even gone into the database questions. How do you think they got those voters? This is all those lists, databases. It's not a war on terror that they're collecting these names for. It's a war on democracy. See, we're worried about they're violating our civil liberties, but no one's asking why are they doing it, okay? They're doing it because they need to crank up. They know that you're not happy. So th shoplifting three million votes just won't be enough in 2008. It's got to be five. So they have a voter ID requirement and databases. So I'm telling you now, and I'm telling you where the next oil war will be in Venezuela. Don't worry about the Punch and Judy show with Mad Mahmoud. What are you going to do about it? I was talking with Martin Luther King III, and he told a group of civil rights leaders, he says, I'm going to take Greg's book and place it on my father's grave. And he'll be pleased. And I was very moved by that. But, but then I thought, hey, you're going to get the book dirty. 
and maybe there's a better use than Jesse Jackson. I'm not making this up, by the way. I, I, not that I make up anything. But, um, and Jesse Jackson said, what we do is we march down Pennsylvania Avenue and we throw the book through the window. Yeah. He said, Jackson said, who is co-sponsoring the Arm Madhouse tour through Operation Push, he said, because he said, we march, we win every time. He said, when we crossed the bridge, when African Americans crossed the Birmingham Bridge in 1964 and won the vote, we didn't have the vote, but we marched and we won the vote. We marched against the war in Vietnam and won the peace. Labor unions, women's groups, the populist movement, we march, we win, okay? That's the beginning. What do we do, okay? What about they're gonna steal the elections? So why bother voting? Why bother? Why bother? They've got it all wrapped up, why bother? Okay, why bother? Someone's gonna to have to vote for the guys in Taos Precinct 13. They're not gonna count their votes. Let me tell you something. When I went there, in the morning, every morning, every morning, the veterans, because every native goes into the military, let me tell you. Who do you think's out there? Every morning they raise the American flag and salute it. And I didn't quite get it. You know, they take away their vote. They said they take away our votes. They take away our land. They take away our kids to the war. but will be damned if they're going to take away our flag and our country. <laughs> Who are the patriots? The guys stealing votes from suspect soldiers? I don't think so. So what are you going to do about it? The answer is make them steal it. Okay, two million votes were stolen in the 2000 election. In 2004, it was three million. In 2006, it will be eight million. Well, if they're going to steal, excuse me, five million votes, that's my prediction. Watch that number. And if they're going to take five million votes, then damn it, we're going to bring six million people to the polls. And if they keep 140,000 troops in Iraq, to enhance their relationship with OPEC, then we will have 140,000 people marching in every city in the United States, starting with Portland. Right now, I want to commit it. Okay, I'll just leave you with this. There's one thing that George Bush said that I agree with before he moved into Iraq to enhance our relationship with OPEC. On March 17th of 2003, he turned to the Iraqi people and said something that I think we should take to heart. He said, do not fight for a dying regime. It is not worth your life. Thank you, and I'll sign your books and answer your questions out there.